listening to the Poho Experience. Yo, welcome back to another episode. In this episode, I kind of want to open with this question I've been getting a lot for some reason for this past week. I get it on a regular basis, but it just seems to be a lot more this past week. And it is not exactly a specific question, but it'll be something like, hey, my coach or my PT told me that I should avoid this or I shouldn't do that. Or if I don't work out until I'm super sweaty or my heart beats above a certain BPM, then I'm not doing it right. Is that correct and a lot of the things are just simply not right at all it's like coaches are telling them to cut carbs or telling them they need to do specific exercises for abs it's just blatantly wrong information i guess i just wanted to open this episode by saying that you know i mean there are good coaches but there is a handful of not so great coaches as well the same way where you know there are good doctors out there they are ones that know what they're talking about and then there are ones that are are not so great which is why whenever you have a more serious health issue, it's always recommended that you get a second or third opinion. And when it comes to hiring a PT, I think there's enough information out there for you to kind of judge whether the PT you're working with knows what they're doing. I mean, at the very least, if you're going to work with someone, kind of do a background check to see what they're all about first before just jumping in and signing for like half a year or something. Because I think in the world of PTs, every PT has their own specialty and has their own kind of flavor or way of doing things. And I think there's nothing wrong with that as long as you don't stray from the fundamentals like there's no debate that the only way to lose weight is to be in a consistent calorie deficit and the only way to gain weight is to be in a consistent calorie surplus there's like zero room for debate in that but how to achieve the deficit or the surplus that's everyone to their own you know some people might really believe in intermittent fasting so they keep pushing that some people might be really into keto and push into that and there are gonna be a handful like me where we believe always work and what's more important is that the individual figure out a way that works for them. It's like, I don't feel there's anything wrong with that, but it's completely wrong if somebody's telling you to cut out carbs or, you know, do certain exercises that aren't getting you to your goals. No amount of setups, planks, or, you know, whatever exercise you want to throw in there, no amount of that is going to get you abs. It's just, that's just facts. It's like, if a coach knows what they're doing and you're trying to get abs, there's actually zero exercise to do it. The main thing to work on is the diet if the individual's main goal is abs. By the way, I wanted to make a comment on that because I guess it does make sense. You know, it's the beginning of the year in the fitness and health industry. The beginning of the year is the most booming time, right? A lot of people have New Year's resolutions. They're more willing to ask for help and spend on their goals. So signups to coaches and PTs and all that is definitely considered as a high season. But it just kind of bothers me that, you know, there's coaches out there that are kind of spreading blatantly false information, which I guess is expected. You know, you can't expect every single coach out there to, I mean, there's always going to be bad apples but it's just oh man it sucks it, it really sucks because you know i've been at that place where i wasn't a coach yet i wasn't a certified pt yet and i was that guy i was the overweight guy that needed help and if this was the kind of information fed to me and then i ended up having no results all it really does is make me feel like i'm hopeless right because i hired a professional they told me to do something i'm unable to do it like i'm unable to cut carbs or i do so much sit-ups and crunches for months, maybe even years, and there's no ab visible, I'd feel so hopeless. I'd feel like, man, I just, I suck. And there's no hope for me because, you know, even this professional can't help me out when the problem really isn't me, but is in the professional and he's just completely giving wrong advice. But anyway, rant over. That's not really what I wanted to talk about today. It just came up on my mind because I literally just got like two or three more DMs about that. And while I reply to those individually, I felt like I should voice it out here to tell all of you, you know, be careful, you know, be careful who you listen to, be careful where you take your information from. Like information is so vast these days. Sometimes you just don't know what's right and wrong. And if you don't know what's right and wrong, it's like, feel free to ask. Like I'm more than happy to answer any questions you have. Of course, there's sometimes, you know, I miss out your questions because I wasn't able to read them, but you know, don't give up. Keep asking until you get your answer before going down a road that ends up being completely pointless, waste your time and unnecessarily takes away your self-esteem. And so the main thing I wanted to cover today was the difference between losing weight and being healthy. 
because I see it being clumped together a lot. And if you've been following my content for a while, you know I've talked about this before, but I think today I'll go a little bit more in depth, more in depth than I think I've ever written or talked about in the past. And so I found that one thing that made it very easy for me to understand this whole process is to break it down into two completely separate things, right? You know, losing weight and being healthy are two completely different subjects, meaning it's absolutely possible to eat 100% healthy, like all nutrient-rich whole foods, you're hitting all your recommended protein. You could be doing that every single day for months and months, but still gain weight because gaining or losing weight has nothing to do with the types of food that you're eating, but the amounts of foods that you're eating, which also means it's completely possible to lose weight eating just, you know, French fries and beer. You know, if you're in a calorie deficit and eating just French fries and beer, not only are you on a vegetarian slash vegan diet, you'll be losing weight. And it's the least nutrient rich diet there could be, but 100% in a deficit, you will lose weight there too. And I feel it's really important to identify that because the recommendation is not to go at either extreme, right? Like don't just eat French fries and beer and try to lose weight like that. And also don't kill yourself trying to eat 100% clean or 100% healthy to progress towards your goals either because both suck. Both have some negative detrimental factors to your life. No nutrient rich foods for a prolonged period in your life means, you know, likely some health issues are going to crop up while eating 100% clean for a prolonged amount of time could mean you just go mentally insane because physically you're all good. Mentally, you're just about to, you know, scream and bang your head on a wall because you have to avoid all of your favorite foods. You know, life has been taken away, although the physical being is kind of A-OK. So, of course, the balance is somewhere in the middle between the two. And this is where you usually hear me throw out that 80% healthy, 20% whatever you want that likely gets you to your goals, doesn't take away life and has enough nutrients to keep you healthy, keep you as healthy as you could be. One of the questions that I get a lot about losing weight is what is a healthy way to lose weight? And usually when I'm asked that question, there's just not enough space for me to elaborate the answer. My answer is usually, well, you have to separate the two to healthy depends on a lot of factors while losing weight is merely being on a consistent calorie deficit. And so I wanted to break down the different elements of physical health to kind of show you how complicated that answer to that would be and not as simple as well just eat whole foods hit your proteins and be in a calorie deficit. And that would be losing weight in a healthy way. Because I think diet is only one of the elements to health. So I see physical health in four parts, right? Diet, sleep, activity level, and exercise. Diet is the one that, you know, we talk about the most here. And you probably hear me ramble on every single day. If you're in my Q&As, that's what we always talk about. Diet in a health perspective is about that 80-20, about 80% eating nutrient-rich whole foods, hitting a recommended protein, and not just doing it for one day, but like making that your lifestyle. And to bring that down even further, you're talking about, you know, every day, a variety of veggies, fruits, whole grains, and hitting your recommended protein levels. And the reason for variety of fruits and veggies and whole grains is that each individual veggie or fruits, they carry different amounts of certain vitamins and minerals. Like an orange might have a lot of vitamin C and carrots might have a lot of vitamin A. So, you know, when you mix up the two, you get the good chunk of vitamin A, you get a good chunk of vitamin C. Rather than going down the rabbit hole of figuring out what every fruit or veggie specializes in and their vitamin and minerals content, like you'll usually be okay if you just eat a variety, say a box of fruits of just oranges or same volume, but some orange, some apple, some kiwi, some banana, some strawberries. That's way better than just oranges, that just one type. And it's same with veggies, right? Rather than just spinach, if you're having some spinach, onion, garlic, spring onions, cabbage, broccoli, all mixed together, it's a lot better than just broccoli broccoli. But of course, that's like the ideal. There's going to be days where eating one type is a lot easier and that's fine too. And when it comes to recommended protein, it's the usual recommended figure that I put out there, which is 1.6 to 2 grams of protein per kilogram of body weight. Just to give you an example, let's say for somebody that's 55 kilograms, that would be 55 times 1.6 as a minimum, which puts you at 88 grams of protein. And so if you're 55 kilograms, you should aim for for at least 88 grams of protein every single day. Now, I know for a lot of people that aren't used to including a lot of protein in their diet, it's difficult. It's not easy. It takes effort. It took a lot of effort for me. For me, it was a big reason why I started to include whey protein in my diet. Because
because I just wasn't able to hit my proteins. Not in the sense that I wasn't able to, you know, prepare the foods and all that. It's just eating it became quite miserable. Like all the food fits in my diet just fine. But then eating so much protein, I just ended up not enjoying food as much or became more stressed out with my diet than I thought I should be. Because basically what one scoop of whey protein does is it's the same amount of protein as a piece of chicken breast, which is roughly anywhere between 25 to 35 grams of protein. But it's so much easier to just drink a drink than it is to eat chicken breast day in and day out. I mean, it gets kind of boring. I've tried it, right? I've tried it before to the point where I was like, okay, let me let me try some whey. Maybe this will make life a little bit easier. And when I tried it, I realized, oh, this is this does make a difference. It takes a lot of the pressure off and it makes it so much easier to hit the 1.6 recommended amount. Like with the 55 kilogram individual, if your goal is 88 grams per day, having a scoop of whey protein is let's say it's 30 grams of protein, that means you're left with 58 grams to hit through normal foods. And that's quite easy to hit within two meals. If you just emphasize on the amount of protein that you're eating per meal, 29 grams of protein per meal isn't that much at all. It's uh, quite doable. And that's calculating it in two meals. If you're eating three meals, you divide it by three, it's even easier to hit. But either way, the main thing that I wanted to emphasize is that if initially, and by initially, I mean the first couple of months, right? There's no rush for this. If you're trying to hit a protein goal and you're unable to just do it slowly let's say your goal is 88 grams you measured how much you eat on a regular basis it's only 50 grams try adding five grams per week right wherever it comes from from adding a bigger serving of protein when you're eating or you know snacking on edamame beans between your meals or anything anything at all but take it slowly it'll be a lot easier to maintain and sustain in the future as compared to like oh okay i'm eating 50 now i gotta add additional 30 and i don't know where to get that from and it feels very very hard to get and why hitting the recommended proteins i feel is detrimental to health is because as studies have shown that eating more protein at least within the recommended levels like if you go above two grams per kilogram body weight of protein there's really no current evidence that shows that it's more beneficial than 1.6 so it's kind of unnecessary but there's also no evidence that it the whole myth of damaging your kidneys or whatnot protein doesn't do that like don't worry about that at all of course for the healthy individual right if you do have some some medical conditions and all that, do check it up with your medical advisor first before jumping into a specific diet. But point is, eating enough protein means that if you are gaining weight, that you are gaining more muscle and less fat. And if you're losing weight, you're losing more fat and less muscle. And muscle is just one of those things like it's just all around positive, right? More muscle means more metabolism. More metabolism means more TDEE, which means you need to eat more calories in a day in order to maintain your weight, which means you get to eat more food. And then it also means you're stronger. You can lift heavier things, perhaps, you know, going for groceries and all that. You used to need to lug around a little cart. Now you could just put it all on your shoulders and it's all okay. Or, you know, when you travel, you got to get your luggage from baggage claim and you don't need anyone's help at all. It's all easy. It's just, it's all around increases in quality of life. And this is like even without strength training, right? Strength training will, of course, make it even more. Like it will boost that. Everything I just said, it's a boost that you will will gain even more muscle than fat if you're gaining weight. You'll lose even more fat and preserve more muscle if you're losing weight. And you'll just be X times more stronger than if you're not working out at all. But protein by itself, just by merely consuming the recommended levels, you will end up with more muscle than compared to if you weren't hitting those recommended levels. And I think one of the main things to think about is, you know, as you grow older, muscles become a really, really important part of quality of life. I mean, it is the difference between you being able to to pick up something off the floor, you having the ability to sit on a toilet and stand back up, that's all muscle when you're in your 70s, 80s, 90s. We see this very common with the elderly where you know they're having trouble walking or they become very fragile, like a slip or a fall just breaks bones and all that. And a lot of that is really lack of muscle, right? You don't have that extra cushion to protect you when you fall. You don't have that extra muscle to be in control of your mobility, of your ligaments. I think that's a conversation 
conversation that a lot of people don't really talk about. I mean, it's out there if you really look for it. You know, for most people, you talk muscle, they think about, oh, you know, bodybuilders or, you know, six pack photo shoots or beach bodies. And while, while, you know, all of that is nice, I think there's a deeper element to proteins and muscle than just that. I think it's a really important factor of life that just doesn't get discussed as much. So anyway, we're still on number one of breaking down the elements of physical health, which is diet. And so to wrap it up, protein's important, whole foods is important, do the 80-20, but also make sure you're being hydrated, right? Throughout the day, you want to be drinking anything between 1,500 to 2,000 cc's of water. Like don't drink it all at once, like spread it out throughout the day, but 1,005 to 2,000 minimum is a recommended level. I think I personally drink around 3,000 and that's just become a habit. Initially, before I started to make it a thing, this was during my weight loss journey, I think. I think I figured out that I wasn't drinking enough water and I made an effort to drink more. When I wasn't watching my water intake, I was barely getting like 900 cc's or 1,000 cc's a day. And I thought I felt fine until I started to drink more and I realized, oh man, I feel fresher throughout the day. I feel, I don't know how to put it. Like I want to put it scientifically, but a lot of this is really just my personal experience. I mean, yes, there studies have shown, you know, more water intake equals, you know, better health basically. But a lot of people aren't really able to feel that. And for me, my feeling was when I started to drink more water was that I just overall felt better. I think I was hungry less. I wouldn't say it was like significant. Like it wasn't like I drank water and then hunger went away, but hunger felt more tolerable. I think there was a lot of times back in my 123 kilo days where I kind of confused between thirst and hunger. Like I'd actually be thirsty, but I'd gobble down a bunch of snacks and all that, trying to quench that thirst. And eventually what makes me fulfilled is, you know, after all the snacks, downing a soda or something, and then, oh, that hits the spot. Because when I think back now, I think it was a hydration issue rather than cravings and hunger. But anyway, sidetrack there. That's basically the diet blueprint for health. This is just about health you know we're not talking about maintenance calorie surplus or deficits this is just about health which is on its own category and so the second element to health in my eyes would be sleep and i know sleep goes a lot deeper i know a lot of people talk about rem about quality of sleep just the time itself isn't a good indicator of whether you're actually getting enough sleep or not and i'm not going to go into that because i'm not going to pretend i'm an expert i'm absolutely not all i can say is sleep is 100 percent important for health it's pretty much the more the better whether we're talking about quality or not quality like if you're only getting three hours six hours is going to be better of course some people may argue three hours of super high quality sleep will be better than six hours of shitty quality sleep but i think for the average individual that doesn't know what's going on that doesn't really do anything particular to change the way they are sleeping just sleeping the same way that you're sleeping three hours versus six hours six hours is going to give you more benefits than three hours as simple as that and then if you want to dig deep Deeper. You're welcome to dig deeper, but I'm afraid that's the brink of my expertise on sleep. And so, you know, I've read studies on sleep and the consensus is roughly like seven to eight hours a day minimum and more, I think, to like nine hours is still OK. But more than that, it starts to have like depreciating effects, but still way, way better than not sleeping enough. And I have a really good example to give you, actually. So in the beginning, when I was doing IGTV, right, in about the first 200 episodes, I was probably averaging three to four four hours sleep because I was uploading every day, but I had no idea what I was doing. I was learning everything new, how to work the cameras, learning how to edit in Adobe Premiere. I didn't take a course. I didn't know anything about this. I figured everything out by YouTube. And so there was just a lot of time spent on trying to figure out small things. And the only way for me to figure all that out was to basically sacrifice sleep, right? Because I wanted to upload every single day. That was something I was dedicated to that I wanted to do that I felt was detrimental to my personal growth and the channel's growth. So I kept on going. And those days, now that I reflect back, was actually a huge, a lot of the time was wasted. Like I spent a lot of time just trying to stay awake. It wasn't like I was being super efficient with three to four hours of sleep. I'm battling to stay awake. I'm drinking monster energy. I'm getting coffee, chewing gum, snacking on some lower calorie foods so I don't go overboard, but so I can stay awake. I remember the grind. It was, it just felt like swimming in mud. And then there would be the few times where I did 
get enough sleep for whatever reason. Like I get, you know, six to seven hours of sleep and all the things that I needed to do just took a lot less time. I felt fresher. I was able to think. And so all the times that I was fighting to stay awake, I was probably looking at a task that would take me five minutes if I was fresh. But because I was trying to stay awake, that same task took one or two hours. So it was kind of like I just completely screwed myself, right? Didn't give myself enough sleep and it became so, so inefficient because of that, but still was so stubborn that I wanted to upload every single day that I kept doing it anyway until finally over around 200 days that I learned some skills, some things became more autopilot mode. I was able to get things done a little bit faster because when I think back in that experience is that when I don't have enough sleep, I do experience a lot of brain fog. Like I'm just not able to think clearly. I'm not able to make decisions as fast and just not motivated. Like, you know, it's really those like dreadful days where you just don't feel like moving, don't feel like doing anything. You're just blah. And I found that whenever I have lack of sleep, I tend to feel that way. And it's come to a point where it's quite evident for me. Like I know that if the night before I didn't have enough sleep, everything's going to be a struggle today. Like I already know it. Even workouts will be a struggle. Like if I had enough sleep, I find myself working out really efficiently. I'm just, you know, set after set after set, very strict and on point with the rest periods. But if I'm lacking sleep and I'm working out that day, man... Even during the workout, I'm looking for ways to prolong it, right? I'm taking longer rest than usual because I'm surfing IG or I'm watching YouTube. And all of it is kind of just this, it's a mood, right? I'm unable to motivate myself to go at full speed. I'm able to motivate myself to do it, but just not in the most efficient way possible. And that all comes down to whether sleeping enough or not. I think it's likely true for most of us where, you know, the first thing we sacrifice is always sleep. If we have some other priority, priorities, some other passion that we're pursuing, first thing to go is always sleep. We'll still keep in check our diet. Workouts, we'll still more or less try to do it. But sleep, oh, you know, fuck sleep. We don't need sleep. Who needs sleep? And then whether we know it or not, it comes to bite us in the ass. And we were wondering why. It's like, oh man, how come I'm so tired? How come I've been so tired these past few days? And if you really look back, it's like, yeah, man, you've been sleeping three to four hours for the past five days. This body can't catch up. You know, sleep is when your body recovers. And when you're not giving your body enough time to recover, you're not going to be feeling so good. And so, yeah, second element of health, I feel, is sleep. And so the third thing is daily activity level. And with daily activity level, I don't mean exercise. Exercise, right? I mean just your day-to-day activity, keeping active, keeping the blood flowing in the body, moving around, making sure you're, you know, we're in an era where it's very easy to just sit in front of a computer, sit in front of a TV for the whole day, especially these past five years where you don't even really need a computer anymore. You can do everything on your phone. You can have a Zoom meeting on your phone. You can write contracts on your phone. You can order food. You can deliver parcels, everything. It's like you could literally just sit down and get so much things done but when that happens you're not moving your body much yeah that's not that's not the best thing for health it's like the whole people said what sitting is the new smoking like you know that that kind of direction you know sitting too long and not being active can cause health issues which is why you know hitting a certain step count in a day is very beneficial to health and in the study that i was discussing in the other episode it lowers all cause mortality and so what does being more active actually look like it's stuff like you know walking more taking the stairs when it's possible, being more on your feet, taking some time to stretch during the day. I think most like smartwatches now, they have this thing where it reminds you to move every certain amount of minutes. I hate it. You know, I always turn it off, but that's the kind of thing, right? It's getting you to move, getting you to get the blood flowing in the body so it's not stationary all the time. Even things like doing more house chores, that helps you move more, you know, washing the dishes, doing the laundry. I know those things I used to hate, but then ever since I realized that I got to up my activity level, it became a thing that I don't exactly look forward to, but I don't mind as much. Like my duty at home every single day is to wash the dishes. That's my home job. And it's getting to a time where I actually kind of enjoy it because it's a time to clean up the whole kitchen, give it a whole wipe down. So tomorrow it's a completely new day. Like daily activity level or AKA steps wasn't something that I took very seriously until maybe a year ago, where the study that made me really get into it was on the correlation between between step count and all-cause mortality. But I think the main thing was it made me realize that daily activity level and exercise are two separate things and they're both equally important. Because I used to think, you know, I was working out six times a week and each one of those sessions was one to one and a half hours long. And I was going hard, right? I was on a powerlifting program. I was, you know, lifting 
hundreds of kilos. It wasn't low intensity at all. And I thought that should be enough in terms of movement and exercise altogether for health. But over time, I started to realize that while exercise is important, it doesn't mean you get to skip out on the steps. It doesn't mean after the one hour, one hour and a half session that I get to sit on my ass the rest of the day. Like that actually isn't great for health either. I mean, it's not bad. It's just remember, everything I'm talking about here is about being optimal. And and because I try to be optimal, like my whole goal is like optimizing my health, but optimizing my health, not to the point where I completely sacrifice life. And I think that's the struggle that I go through every day. It's not that I don't know what to do. I know exactly what to do to be 100% health. But I also know that if I do that, then I lose out my life. My life is just completely boring and not flexible and all about diet, exercise, sleep and activity level where there's no room for partying. There's no room for alcohol. There's no room for feeling any of the joys in life because it might get in the way of these things. So I'm very clear about that. But for me, it's how do I maximize it? How do I maximize the things that I got to do for health and also maximize the amount of fun I have? I don't want to have too much fun and then start neglecting all the health stuff, but I don't want to do too much health stuff that I start neglecting having fun. So that's really my aim here, at least for, for my personal goals. My personal goals is to find the optimization. I just wanted to clear that up because, you know, I, I know I'm listing a lot of things here and you might be listening thinking like, oh, God damn, I'm not doing any of this or I'm only doing 10 or 20 percent of this. Like this is so much. This is so stressful. And no, it's totally fine. This is what 100 percent looks like. And you don't need 100 percent, right? You probably want to hit 80 percent. So 70 percent, 80 percent, that's good enough. That's good enough for optimization in my eyes. So please don't get stressed out when you're listening to all of this. But yeah, that's daily activity level. And so finally, we get down to exercise, which is the final thing in my eyes in the elements of health. And so exercise, it can be both, you know, strength training or cardio. Of course, again, optimizing, you should do both. And you don't have to do both equally. I feel if you're optimizing, you do 90% of the one you enjoy more and 10% of the one you don't. So you could totally be on a marathon running route or you want to be a rock climber or a cyclist. That's totally fine, but 10% do strength training. If you're the opposite, if you're like me, you know, I enjoy lifting, I enjoy powerlifting and all that. Yeah, okay, 90% do that and 10% fit some cardio in. Like for health, that is the best. It's not either or, it's always both. And roughly just for measurement's sake, you want to aim for something like three, four times a week of roughly one hour session each week. And I know that's a really, really shit way to measure the exercise you're doing because one hour of lifting super light weights that get you no sweat, no pump, no nothing is pointless and a waste of time. But you know what I'm trying to illustrate here is going kind of hard three to four times a week for about an hour. It's a starting point. It's just an aim. I know, you know, if you're doing like HIIT, right, you'll be done in half an hour and you went all out. I, I get that. It's just a rough indicator if you don't know where to start. If you don't know where to start, like how much exercise should I be doing? Well, you know, aim for whatever it is. You're doing yoga, you're doing ice skating, you're doing basketball, you're playing soccer, badminton, whatever it is, three to four times a week of roughly one hour hour would suffice and be pretty optimal for health. And I want to remind you here that there's no bad exercise, like anything will do. You don't have to lift weights and you don't have to run. These aren't the only choices for working out. Every single sport out there is fine. Pilates, yoga, boxing, jujitsu, MMA, dance, gymnastics, everything is fine. Like just pick the one that you like. There's no optimal one for health. They're all great for health, every single one of them. Pick the one that you enjoy because that will be the easiest one that you stick to. Like, Can you imagine you hate running and you're trying to make yourself run like 10K a week? That's just hell. But if you love dance, right? You love dance and you're making yourself go to dance class four times a week, that's like peanuts. That's nothing. You're probably like, man, if I have more time, I want to take dance class seven times a week. For health, you're getting the same benefits. Dancing for 60 minutes straight three to four times a week versus running 10K a week. I think it's hard to argue that one's better than another health-wise, but one's definitely easier to stick to than the other. So, you know, always pick the one that you can stick to because that's your highest chance of getting the most benefits out of it. And then, of course, all that was physical health, right? Then comes mental health. And mental health is a topic that I've really been wanting to talk about because I've made so much progress on my own in the past, you know, five or six years but I don't know where to start. I feel like this isn't a place of my expertise at all. And if I were to share anything, it would be 
purely just my own experience. I can't emphasize enough how important mental health is. I think it's a topic that is not discussed enough. I think that a lot of times where we're trying to work on the physical thing, you know, we're trying to work on our diet, our exercise and all that. But our main problem is our mental health. And until our mental health gets fixed, doing the diet and exercise and all that just will forever be struggling with them because the root of the problem is our mental health. And without fixing the root, the problem is always there. It's, it's like, you know, you don't fix the faucet, you try to fix the well. But I've been thinking about it. And the more that I have a direction on how to share this, I'll probably share it in a way where I just take you through what I was going through from the beginning and all the hurdles that I had to get through until this day. Because I think currently I'm at my healthiest mental health wise, but there was a lot going on with me in the past few years that it feels like I'm a completely different person now. I don't know if you can see the change through my content, or maybe you can. I think the way I do this podcast, all the things I'm saying is, although some of the topics and the essence of the things I'm saying is the same, I know that the way I'm saying it is a lot more different. And I attribute that to where my head is right now compared to before. Like even saying that, I feel weird because I'm unable to pinpoint and explain why, which is why I got to think a lot more about it. But I just wanted to emphasize that, you know, mental health is a big thing too. When somebody asks me like, you know, how do you lose weight in a healthy way? Healthy is such a big subject. It's like, you're talking about two things. It's like, how do I make money and be happy? It's like, oh man, making money is one thing and being happy is another. And they don't exactly go together. Like, how do you explain that money doesn't bring happiness and happiness doesn't bring money, but they could, but they don't really. And it's two different topics. It's like that kind of thing, right? But yeah, I'm kind of rambling on now that's what i wanted to cover today you know the different elements of health what health really means if that's something you're chasing and the different things to consider about it because it's not just diet i think a lot of times we think that we eat well and everything is well it's like no 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 man it's eating well is great but there's other things you got to watch out for too that doesn't cover all the bases I think about a week ago, Mr. Beast came out with a video as of today has 90 million views. That's 90 million views in like seven to eight days. It's crazy. And the video is titled a thousand blind people see for the first time. Now, if you haven't watched this, I'd say go check it out. I don't really watch Mr. Beast stuff. I listen to a lot of his interviews to get his insight about how he approaches YouTube and all that. But his content, I got to be honest, I don't love. I don't hate. It's just I don't think his content is geared at I'm not his target audience. But this particular video, I did check it out and it's just it's just very heartwarming, right? He's basically paying for a lot of people's eye procedure and helping them see clearly for the first time. And it's it's just great is that the things that he's doing. I mean, one thing I'll always admire about Mr. Beast is he's genuinely one of those guys where he makes a lot of money but puts it all back. And while of course he puts it back to his business, his team and all that, but he also gives a lot of money back. The amount of charity he's been doing is truly beyond amazing. But you know, why I wanted to talk about it is the fact that he got a lot of backlash for this video. There's a lot of angles to the backlash, but you know, some people are saying like, oh, you know, Mr. Beast is just using these people to get more views. He's just, you know, he's not actually a nice guy. He just wanted to make a YouTube video. So he did this. And I'm here thinking like, what? Since when was it mutually exclusive to do something good and earn money off of it or gain something out of it? Like you can do something good and gain something yourself. And that's not a bad thing, right? Why is everybody making out to be like, this is some evil business crypto scam that Mr. Beast is handing out. Like he's obviously changing these people's lives in a good way. And if he's doing it for views, well, good for him. I mean, he does deserves all the views. And it really reminded me of this whole fat loss journey, right? I've experienced this myself and I have a lot of people tell me the similar story where we've made certain amount of progress in our fat loss journey and we see family and friends that maybe haven't seen us for a while and they don't see it, right? They don't see it. They might even comment something the complete opposite. Like I remember when my cousin first saw me when I lost my first 20 kilograms, who haven't seen each other for a year, but the last time he saw me, I was 20 kilograms heavier. But the first thing he asked, 
asked me when he saw me, he's like, hey, man, oh, man, still big, huh? Still not going on a diet yet? And I was like, motherfucker, I've lost 20 kilograms. But, you know, I, I couldn't be bothered to to explain myself already. So I was just like, yeah, yeah, I'm still trying. But it's like, it's already, I'm, I already lost 20 kilograms. Like, what more do you want? And with my own parents, around that time, they started to tell me, it's like, hey, I think you, you, you're you losing too much weight. You know, you, you're looking unhealthy now. You don't look good anymore. I'm there thinking like, what do you mean, mom? Yeah, I'm 20 kilos lighter, but I'm still 100 kilos. And based on the BMI, I'm still obese. Like I just had a doctor's checkup and the doctor said I'm obese and I better do something about it. But regardless, it's like I worked so hard to lose that 20 kilograms. And yet these are the type of comments that I'm getting in my everyday life. And it feels so much like that with the Mr. Beast video, because it's like, man, he's just he, he's doing something great. Like, how could you like if you're truly bothered by Mr. Beast? helping people see for the first time. I'd say you need to go say a prayer and you need to go thank God, whichever God you believe in, that your life is so good that this is something that you have to complain about. Because there's just, I guess I wasn't surprised that that's the world's reaction because in the influencer world, you can't win, right? No matter what you do, no matter how great or how bad it is, there's always going to be two sides. You do something bad, somebody's going to say it's good. But then it just surprised me that something so obviously wasn't a bad thing. It became a bad thing and it became a whole controversy. It was like, what world are we living in? It's a, it's a, I don't even know what to say anymore. But then I wanted to talk about it today to kind of remind you or all of us on our journey of our own, whether it's health, weight loss, muscle gain, or chasing whatever passion that we have, we have to realize that, you know, no matter where we get to, it's very important that we're clear with what we're doing ourselves. Because if we're not clear and you get swayed by the comments of other people that have no idea what they're talking about, it's very easy to feel down about it. It's very easy to want to give up, even though you did nothing wrong and you're doing absolutely amazing because of the vibe the people around you are giving you. And while that sounds very lonely, it kind of is. I I guess the the road to passion, the road to self-improvement, the road to chase something that you really, really want is kind of lonely because there will always be more people that don't understand you than the amount of people that do understand you. But it just kind of comes with it is what it is, basically. But yeah, if you haven't checked that video out, highly recommend you to go check it out. I haven't really watched any of his other videos. I think the last Mr. Beast video I watched was his Squid Game video. And I didn't even watch it from beginning to end. I watched it like skipping around, seeing what he did, what the whole hoo-ha is, and that was it. But this one, I stayed for the whole thing. And I gotta admit, you know, some parts of it got me a little bit choked up. It was it was, it was, was really great. It's, it's really amazing. I think the world needs more people like him. Just in his own lane, doing something he loves, and at the same time, helping a lot of other people in their lives along the way. The last thing that I wanted to talk about was a story that broke a couple of days ago, but then 24 hours after that, they made a statement to retract everything that was said, but I still kind of want to talk about it anyway. And so here it is. It is about Netflix. So Netflix came out with an official statement a couple of days ago saying that you can't share your accounts anymore. They're really cracking down on this password sharing thing, which I don't really take any problem with because we use Netflix at home and we don't travel that much. So it's not really a big issue, but I just thought it was a really shitty decision because I know a lot of people that do share it and their product isn't as good as it was two, three years ago that it's essential to own. In other words, if I was in the situation now and Netflix made it a problem for me to share a family account because we might be, say, living in different locations for whatnot, but still, you know, still within the family unit, if they were to cancel my subscription because of that, I'd just simply stop using it. Like I wouldn't get two accounts. Just simply because there's nothing much to watch on Netflix now. And so what they were saying in the statement was basically your Netflix account is as shareable as a toilet now, right? If somebody wants to use your toilet at home, they have to come over. You can't bring your toilet out to them. You have to watch something and log in at your primary location every 31 days. So it's kind of like if I didn't live at home, I, I live somewhere else at work, I have to make sure I come home and watch Netflix once every 31 days or 
risk the banning of my account. And if there's a traveling to a different country, I think how they track you is based on your IP and the device that you're using it on. If you travel to another country and you're on a different IP, you can request a temporary code to have access for seven days. But then that means you can't go overseas for more than seven days. Like, how does that even make sense? Like, I have to plan my trip around Netflix. Of course, nobody would ever do that. But it's like, why are you making it so difficult to everybody? It's like, and the thing is, your product is a luxury item now. It's not a necessity. I mean, yes, back two, three years ago, there was no other platform than Netflix. Netflix was the main place to watch your shows and all that. And, you know, that's where Netflix and chill came from. You even got your lone little slogan for it. But nowadays you got HBO, you got Disney Plus, like you're not the only thing. And YouTube's coming out with a lot of stuff too. So it's like, what is this seven days thing? What does this have to log in every 31 days? I really don't understand how some companies think sometimes it's like you're literally digging your own grave and i understand i understand that you know password sharing and all that it hurts their profits but this decision of trying to clamp down on password sharing is also hurting those that aren't really using it in a way that they did not intend it's like likely now if somebody loses their netflix account they'll just watch something else or resort to piracy if they really want to watch that one thing that's only available on netflix i mean piracy is always a thing and it's 2023 everybody knows how to use torrents and all that and the reason why piracy isn't as dominant now is because you have services like netflix disney plus like spotify where it's because it's so convenient to access everything you want for a small fee you know before spotify how hard was it to you know collect all the songs that you want it's not even about being able to afford it or not just the hassle of having to hunt down that particular cd or cassette tape that you wanted that wasn't available for whatever reason is such a struggle compared to oh if you have a spotify account you basically have access to every single song that's ever released out there old new indie or pop whatever it is and that's why people subscribe to spotify because you could listen to whatever you want in high quality anytime you want and it's kind of the same with netflix right before when netflix was dominating to watch your favorite shows it just meant you had to pay a small fee and you had access to it on your phone on your ipad on your tv it was just so convenient and so easy but that was also also when Netflix was dominating, it was when there were no competitors. It's kind of like YouTube now, right? Without YouTube, there's no one else. What's the next YouTube? But for Netflix, I feel when you take away convenience and it becomes more convenient to pirate, that's when piracy comes back. That's when people aren't willing to pay your price anymore because you're making it so difficult for them. I mean, if they have to watch a show and they have to ask for a code that only lasts for seven days, like what's the point? There's so many steps just to travel and make sure you have access to Netflix because you might watch watch it. You're not 100% going to watch it. It's nice to have the choice. But to go through all these steps, it's like it really becomes not worth it at all. And I really feel Netflix is now just trying to play a numbers game, like trying to make up for their losses or whatever it is to look good on paper. But at the same time, you're losing all your customers that way. And it's also to point out that, you know, Netflix hasn't been doing that great. You know, I've been throwing a lot of money on Netflix originals, which hasn't been doing that well. I mean, there's one or two probably okay ones out there, but it's just not something I'd watch. I don't think I even I haven't opened Netflix in the longest time because usually what I do is I read a lot of manga and if there's anime of it that I want to check out how it was anime adapted I check Netflix if they have it and if they do I'll go watch it and if they don't I don't or I use Netflix as like a background B monitor thing like reruns of friends or uh, reruns of like one punch man but other than that I don't even really access my Netflix account anymore either but either way this whole news came out it it created a lot of, you know, everybody was complaining about it. Everybody was like, well, fuck this, fuck Netflix. Then fine, you know, don't let us share. Then we just won't use it at all. And the next day, the news came out. Netflix was like, oh, we're sorry that statement was wrong. It was mistakenly posted. We're not putting any of this in effect. We've been trying it out in some countries, but for US and the rest of the world, it's not going to happen. This was our mistake. It was a mispost and we take it all back, which I guess is good on them, but it's just such a blunder. Like you didn't have to do that. You didn't have to try something and realize the whole world hates it. All your customers hate it and all your customers don't really care. I'm going to leave. And you're like, all right, all right, sorry, guys. Sorry, guys. Don't don't leave. Please don't leave. And well, this is what the world's come to. I don't know. I just found it funny because it's such a big company. It's freaking Netflix, right? And it's like, why are you making blunders like that? What's going on internally? And it feels like it's that way for a lot of companies, you know, ever since COVID. It's like this whole new ball game that nobody knows how to adapt to. Everybody's made some kind of loss during the COVID times and now they're trying to make it back but making it back kind of using 
not so great tactics or, you know, tactics that in the long run probably bite you in the ass more than any profits you would ever get. But yeah, these two things, the Mr. Beast thing and the Netflix thing all happened within the last episode and this episode. And so I thought I wanted to talk about it because it was the kind of things that I'm drawn to, the kind of news that I catch up with. And so that's about it for this week. This past week, I've been cooking a lot more. That meal prep veggie thing wasn't a one-off thing. It actually started to lead to more cooking. And I might talk more about that next week because I don't know how things are going to go. But it's been kind of exciting being back in the kitchen. I think yesterday I did something brilliant, which was I made a personal little hot pot, but using instant noodle seasoning. Like I saved the noodles for maybe another day if you want to add more noodles to some dish. But I took the seasoning out of the shin ramen, used it as a soup and you know cook veggies fish mushrooms and all that and it was really really great one big pot with a bowl of rice on the side really feels like personal hot pot but i think i'll talk more about that in the weeks to come as i'm getting back into a different routine now i think i'm getting a little bit sick of subway although i'm still having it at least one meal a day instead of two meals whenever i have the chance but either way we'll update you next time so that's it for this week see you next week peace